Hey, Barbs, I'm yeah. thinking about going to Africa. Where do you think I should go? Oh, I think you're gonna like my answer. Tanzania. Now you wouldn't last three days there. Go to Ghana. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. Ghana is kind of like Africa for beginners. People usually come here to test out their sub-Saharan excursion skills for taking off the training wheels and venturing deep into the interior savannas and jungles. So if that's you, your first assignment is to report to Accra and Kumasi at 0700 hours. Move out, soldier! Fun side note, the word Ghana means warrior king, hearkening back to the Ghana Empire in the 4th century AD, which actually wasn't even located in Ghana. Anyway, Ghana is a country about the size of Romania, located in West Africa along the Guinea Gulf, bordered by the Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, and Togo. Ghana is also one of the only eight countries that passes through the Prime Meridian, as well as Antarctica in the south. The country is made up of ten regions with some interesting sounding capitals like Wa, Ho, and Tamale, and of course the capital Accra, yes that's how you pronounce it, Accra, located in the southeast along the coast. The two largest airports are of course the capital Accra Kotoka International and the second largest one Kumasi International located further inland. Hey Barbs. Yeah, what's up? The colonial regions are cool and all, but tell them about the tribal and ethnic regions. You know what Noah, I think I'll give you this one because you're the guy with the better voice. Don't mind if I do. The north is primarily inhabited by the Mole Dogbani peoples. The north central area has the Guan group. The southeast, including the capital Accra, is dominated by the Awe and Ga Adangwe people. Then you get this huge chunk of the west, center, and south areas where you can find the famous Akan and Ashanti peoples. Sometimes this area is collectively referred to as Ashanti land. Wow, Noah, that was uh, a little too good. Too. I don't want the audience liking you more than me. Get out. Now, Ghana is a constitutional republic, but nonetheless still kind of technically has a king or disputably regional kings that act more like cultural figureheads rather than governmentally sanctioned legislators. However, these kings still do hold high positions of influence in society. Nonetheless, the most notable and powerful of all these kings would probably be the monarch Asantehene Nana Otumfuo Ose Tutu II, who rules over Ashanti land. He lives in the Manshia Palace in the Ashanti capital, Kumasi. Otherwise, other notable landmarks in Ghana might include the Almina Castle, the oldest European building in Sub-Saharan Africa built in 1482, as well as the Cape Coast Castle. Each one has a dark history being used for importing slaves. Kwame Nkrumah Mausoleum with the bronze statue of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, not to be confused with the vandalized statue of him during the coup d'etat years. Independence Arch, Usur Fort, the Kakum Canopy Walk, Tengzun Shrine, and the Agbog Bloshi, the world's largest digital waste dump where criminals try to hack into confidential governmental computers. Oh, and the Kejatia Market, the largest in Africa located in Kumasi and Ashanti land. And Ghana even has its own space center, the Ghana Science and Technology Center. And those are just the man-made landmarks. Let's see what Mother Nature brings to the table. Now when it comes to the land, Ghana kind of like accidentally broke a world record. I'm talking about Lake Volta, the world's largest man-made lake fed by the Black, White, and Red Volta rivers. I remember the Burkina Faso episode? If you look at the map, this massive 400 kilometer long body of water that scars the southeast side of Ghana, taking up about 4% of the land, is actually a reservoir byproduct created after the construction of one little guy, the Akosombo Dam. Granted, thousands of people and animals were displaced in the process of the flooding of the basin, but this one little dam produces much of the electricity for the entire country with leftover to export to neighboring countries for external revenue. It was kind of like, So your home will be underwater in a couple months. Get out! What? Eh, I guess it was worth it. Now, the country is divided into four geographic terrestrial plains. The coastal plain, the Shantikwahu, the Volta Basin, and the northern plains. Basically, the south is wetter and the north is drier, sometimes even subject to those Harmattan winds. Remember the Burkina Faso episode? With a more sparsely populated area, the north is home to open savannas and the largest nature reserve, Mole National Park, where you can see animals like elephants, hippos, baboons, crocodiles, and the national animal, the Golden Eagle. Man, mole, tamale, all these Spanish words, I'm surprised the Spanish had nothing to do with Ghana. Or did they? No, they actually literally didn't. Like, almost every European country, even Sweden, got in on it. You know, I think they're actually pretty okay. They had the whole side investment going on anyway, right? Aha. Uh -huh. Ghana is also the second largest cocoa producer after the Ivory Coast. Cadbury, the company that makes those diabetically amazing Easter eggs, actually imports 90% of their cocoa from Ghana, and is actually second in Africa in gold production after South Africa. Gold plays a huge role in Ghana. In fact, the British touted the area as the Gold Coast during colonial times due to the high amount of gold reserves found throughout the country, especially in Ashanti land. This is why you shouldn't be surprised to find more gold material in Kumasi and the surrounding areas. Of course, agriculture-wise, typical African cash crops and staples like cassava, yams, cotton, rubber, sugar, and palm oil are produced along with kanaf, the jack-of-all-trades crop. You can use the fibers in rope, twine, crude cloth, paper, bags. You can even feed it to your animals and use it as their bedding. It's kind of like jute, 
Remember the Bangladesh episode? Man, today is just like a reference overload. Of course, the staple dish made out of cassava and plantain powder is called fufu, a starchy substance typically eaten with stews and meats. Just a little side note, fufu, which goes by many other different names in Africa, like sadsa, nshima, and ugali, is kind of like the staple for many sub-Saharan African countries. It's like what rice is to Asians and bread is to Europeans. Famous national dishes include things like kenke dumplings, wache, and be careful when mentioning jollof rice. Make sure there are no Nigerians around. We invented it, ours is better. The interesting thing though is that although historically Ghana was dominated by an agrarian and mineral extraction based economy, they really branched out and diversified their business portfolio. In 2011, they gained the title of the world's fastest growing economy. Now Ghana focuses on things like the manufacturing industry, electronics, technology, and recently after an oil reserve was discovered in 2007, the hydrocarbon export sector as well, which supplies over one and a half billion extra dollars in state revenue. This is partially why Ghana has one of the lowest unemployment rates in all of Africa at around only six to eight percent annually. They're even slated to join the list of automobile manufacturing countries as well as they just launched their own domestic brand, Kantanka. Otherwise, other amazing natural zones would include places like the Susua and Kokropite beaches, the Paga crocodile ponds where you can sit on lazy crocodiles that just don't care, the Boabeng Fiema monkey sanctuary, the Wili and Kintampo waterfalls, Lake Bosumtwe, Umbrella Rock, and when in doubt, just take a little cruise on Lake Volta, maybe go fishing for a little bit. And it's probably best to have a local show you these areas because you know, locals are the best, aren't they? Here's some more on them. Now, Ghana is not only like Africa's training wheels, but also like Africa's first main sub-Saharan contact to Europe. And yes, the Saharan and Sahel West Coast areas like Senegal and the Gambia had already been discovered, but essentially it wasn't until the Portuguese explorer Fernão Gomes came in the 15th century and established the Elmina Settlement, regarded as the first European settlement in sub-Saharan Africa. Ghana has always been kind of seen as like a beacon of democracy in Africa, in which this guy handed over power to John Kufour, making it the first peaceful democratic transition since independence in 1957, which also made them the first colonial sub-Saharan African country to gain independence from a European power. I mean, technically Liberia gained independence in the 1840s, but it was a confusing US-aided resettlement program and not so much a colony, but eh, make of it what you will. First of all, Ghana has about 27 million people and usually scores in the top most democratic, transparent, stable, and safe nations in all of Africa. The country is made up of over 70 different tribes and over 200 different dialects. However, most of them fall under five main ethnic groups. The majority belonging to the Ashanti or Akan, making up about half of the population, the Dagbani and Mole at around 17%, the Ewe at around 14%, and the remaining groups belonging to other peoples like the Ga Adangbe, Gurma, Guan, and Basa, while the remaining two-ish percent are made up of non-Africans and whites. Also, they use the type G and D plug outlets, they drive on the right side of the road, and they use the Sedi, which is their currency, which also translates to cowrie shell, since those were used as currency at one point in time. Ghana is also very religious. The majority of the population, about three quarters, is Christian, mostly Protestant and Pentecostal. About 15% are Muslim, and the rest adhere to traditional beliefs and faiths. Now, each of the main people groups has a very distinct culture that contrasts with the others, along with mutually unintelligible languages. Nonetheless, English is still used for cross-communication by the majority of the population, as it was a former British colony. The most widely spoken native language though would have to be Chui or various dialects of Chui, spoken by the Akan and Ashanti peoples. Some will say that it's also mutually intelligible with Fante and Brong, and it's kind of just like a dialect thing, like English from America and English from Scotland. You know, there's a lot of different types of Scottish- No, I'm not even gonna try. I'm not even gonna finish. Ga is spoken in the southeast and is said to have originated from Nigeria, whereas Ewe is a language more prevalent and indigenous to Togo, and Dagbani and Mole is spoken in the north and are more closely related to the Mosi language. Remember the Burkina Faso ep- Okay, we get it, just click on the annotation and rewatch the Burkina Faso episode. Hey, it was a good episode, okay? I had fun making it. I mean, African cowboys, come on. Ghanaian culture, though, is a lot more than just Ashanti. Ewe peoples in the East, for example, are known for being amazing cross rhythm drummers and performers of dances, and also the originators of voodoo. The North Dagomba areas have a more Islam influenced culture, and they had their own king, Yakubu II, who was killed in 2002, and since then, the line of succession has been kind of disputed and is yet to be installed. I mean, he did kind of have like over 30 wives and like over 100 children. The Ga Adangbe peoples are actually found mostly in the capital, Accra, as well as other areas in the southeast. Both men and women are known for being really good boxers. They are also known for making the famous Ghanaian fantasy coffins, a tradition that started in the 1950s in which skilled carpenters will custom make a coffin that are designed to capture the essence.
essence of the deceased person's identity. Then of course we reach the Ashanti. Now there is too much about these people to summarize in a few sentences, but in the simplest way I can put it, the Ashanti have always played probably the most culturally dominating role in the history and development of Ghana. Supposedly, they believe they are descended from the ancient Abyssinians that were pushed south from the Egyptians and played a huge role in the Atlantic slave trade as well as the furious rebellions against the British. I mean, they did kind of have to fight like four wars over the course of 70 years to finally give in. Today known for their gold rich people, beautiful kente cloth with elaborately designed patterns and of course the royal family. Otherwise, a few customs Ghanaians from all people groups follow include things like never using your left hand to offer a gift, point or shake someone's hand as a left hand is considered to be the dirty hand. Many children are named after the day of the week they were born on per gender. For example, a boy born on Saturday might have the title Kwame and a girl on Saturday might have Ama. On Sundays, expect to find lots of people dressed in their best clothes as it's church day. To get someone's attention, you'll probably hear a sharp hissing sound. And for some reason, people don't seem to use umbrellas much in the rain. It's not a taboo. It's just kind of the way things are. By the way, if you guys are wondering, Noah's not actually Ganyan. I just wanted to give him more lines in this episode because, you know, that voice. Otherwise, some notable Ghanaian people include Kwame Nkrumah, the first president that led Ghana to independence, Ya Asantewa, the hero queen mother of Ghana who led a rebellion against the British forces in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, New Merris soccer players, of course, British actor Idris Elba, whose mother was Ghanaian, which is good enough. He had Ghanaian blood, Ghana gets the credit. Well, now Ghana may be pretty stable and prosperous, but of course, they couldn't have done it alone. Who does Ghana like to hang with? Ghana has some of the oldest recorded history in Sub-Saharan Africa with roots that extend beyond the continent. First of all, like other regionally distinct nations, Ghana's people groups have historically had alliances with other neighbors for centuries. The Ewe have strong ties to Togo, the Dagombas in the north love Burkina Faso, and the Ashanti were always in touch with the similar Kwa language speaking peoples of Eastern Ivory Coast. Just like many other post-colonial states, Ghana still maintained close ties to the UK and almost immediately after independence, set up agreements and policies that encourage mutual relations. The UK also has the largest community of Ghanaians in the world, followed by New York in the USA, who also has close ties to Ghana as the East Coast is saturated with Ghanaian communities. When it comes to their best friends though, most Ghanaians I talked to have said it would probably be Nigeria. Although they have a heated rivalry in almost everything, be it music, soccer, or you know, this stuff, they still share a deep bond that historically tied them for centuries, especially during colonial times when they shared a mutual struggle. Sierra Leone though is kind of like the cute but dramatic girlfriend that they've been with forever who keeps getting into trouble with the World Health Organization. In conclusion, you know what? Noah, we need that voice again. Just, I'll, I'll let you take the conclusion. Sure thing. In conclusion, Ghana is like one of the few sub-Saharan African countries that transitioned beautifully out of its dark ages, maintained its regional cultures, and stabilized its economy, always keeping a tincture of royal African charm. Stay tuned. Greece is- Greece is coming up! Greece is coming up! It's still my show! Love me! Love me!